We're really very honored to have with us this evening uh, Elizabeth Colbert. It is Colbert, not Colbert. She, <laughs> um, she, she is. Uh, she and Stephen are trying to straighten that out. Um, anyway, Elizabeth is a, um, a, a leading environmental journalist, uh, 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 as, 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 as m many of you are, are aware. She, um, but she, uh, she got into journalism before she, uh, she got into the environment. And before getting into either, she studied literature at Yale. And then while on a Fulbright, Fulbright grant in Germany, um, she started string, stringing for the New York Times. And that led to a full-time job with the Times uh, starting in 1985. Uh, 14 years later, in 1999, she joined the New Yorker. Uh, at the magazine, she's written dozens of pieces. Her first book in 2004, The Prophet of Love and Other Tales of Power and Deceit, uh, profiled a range of uh, New Yorkers from politicians to policemen to bureaucrats. Um, uh, but she uh, was already beginning to turn her attention to covering the environment. Uh, and a prize-winning series on global warming in 2005 led to another book, a Field Notes from a Catastrophe. Uh, her new book, The Sixth, the sixth Extinction, uh, is somewhat of a follow-on to the previous one, but it goes, it goes beyond climate change to the story of mass extinctions, um, the five that occurred in the distant past and the one that Elizabeth describes uh, underway in the present day and is being caused in various ways by humankind. Uh, as she says in the preface, the topic of mass, mass extinction is both morbid and fascinating, uh, not to mention alarming. Um, uh, with captivating detail and persuasive argument, Elizabeth weaves together a wealth of scientific research and personal observations from her journalistic uh, uh, expeditions. Some of you may have seen Al Gore's review on the front of the Sunday New York Times book review section earlier this month. Gore called Elizabeth's book timely, well-written, and, quote, an invaluable contribution to our understanding of present circumstances. Even the Wall Street Journal, uh, which has been known to scoff at some environmental alarmists, said Elizabeth's, quote, lively account is thought-provoking whether or not you agree with its premise. <laughs> and, lest you, and lest you think this is an overwhelmingly depressing book, a, global, a Boston a Globe reviewer wrote, quote, Perhaps the most remarkable thing about her surprisingly breezy, entirely engrossing, and frequently entertaining tour through a half billion years of the ups and precipitous downs of life on Earth, especially the downs, uh, is Colbert's uncanny ability to induce smiles, snorts, and outright laughter as one reads about mass extinction, in <laughs> including humanity's possible demise. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Colbert. Um, thanks a lot. That was a, one of the best introductions I've had for a while. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, okay. Louder. So, louder. louder? Okay, okay, I'll try to yell. Um, I, I thought I would sort of start at the end of the book. Um, it doesn't really have a surprise ending, so you won't, you won't, I'm not ruining anything for you. Um, e each of the chapters has a sort of emblematic species that it's not exactly about, but, but, but it's, it sort of has a, has a focus on one species. And the species at the, at the very end of the book is a, is a Hawaiian crow. A species of Hawaiian crow, and Hawaii actually had used to have several species of crows, at least six that we know of, um, that probably diverge from you know crows are, are the average crow you're seeing around here in D.C. several hundred thousand years ago, and and so it's it's sort of a story like the story of of Darwin's finches, where you know an animal arrives in an archipelago and then it speciates and radiates out so that it can live in different kinds of habitats and survive on different kinds of food. Um, but the difference here is that most of the Hawaiian crows went extinct uh, before modern times, okay? So the earliest hum people, modern humans, reached Hawaii about 1,500 years ago. Uh, they were Polynesian seafarers, very, very um, 
you know, mobile people reached a lot of parts of the world very early on, and they brought with them, among other species, rats, the Pacific rat. And so these, this led to a wave of extinctions already about 1,500 years ago. And the only species of Hawaiian crow that survived into, into modern times was a species that is known as the alala. Uh, and they're only about, this species too is under terrible uh, threat and um, from habitat loss and, and probably also from invasive species. And so in, in about the 80s, people realized, the state of Hawaii realized that this species was also in very deep trouble. And it took the remaining birds into captivity, into a breeding center on Maui. And a, about a year ago, I was out in uh, San Diego at the San Diego Zoo. And they had taken, they run this breeding center in Maui, and they had taken one of the birds uh, from Maui uh, to the San Diego Zoo, to the veterinary hospital there. And he, his name is Kanoe. And Kanoe was, was raised by people. And he uh, is, as, as you might say, a very, very odd duck. Um, he does not self-identify as a bird, um, or at least not as a crow. And so he had refused to mate with any of the female crows uh, at the breeding center. So there are now maybe about 100, 150 birds. So maybe he had you know, 75 uh, females to choose from, but he just refused. Um, and, and they need his genetic material uh, because there are so few left. So they had taken him to this uh, veterinary hospital where he came under the care of a, of a reproductive physiologist by the name of, of Barbara Durant. And every spring, when it was its breeding season, back in Maui, Durant takes Kanoe on her lap several times a week and, and she strokes him in this way that he's supposed to find uh, very, very erotic. Uh, because she is hoping to get a vial uh, of his genetic material uh, to rush over to Maui with and artificially inseminate one of the female crows over there. Um, and when I was there about a year ago, he, I have to say he had not yet you know, delivered on this. Um, but she was preparing to try again, and she took me to, to visit him. And he has this cage, which is not a ca bird cage like you know you can imagine, but a very spatial sort of palatial bird cage. And she had brought him some some treats, um, which are these little what he likes are these little um, hairless baby mice. They're called pinkies, uh, and he came over to us. He came over to sort of peck at them, and he. Uh, as I thought, he sort of seemed embarrassed to see her, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but that, that, may, that may just be projection. Um, but anyway, crows, as you know, as everybody knows, are really, really smart. And Kanoe is very smart, and he's very charismatic. And, he, and crows can imitate human speech. And, and he says, although I have to say I didn't quite understand it the first time he said it, because it sounds sort of demented, but Kanoe says, I know. That is his, uh, that is his um, uh, a phrase. And so he keeps repeating this, I know, I know. And to me, that was, I was sort of most of the way through the book and sort of thinking about how to end it. And he really became, you know, the emblem for this very, very weird, uh, tragic uh, situation with elements of black comedy in it that we find ourselves in where people will go to these extraordinary lengths, right, you know, effectively, uh, you know, giving hand jobs to crows um, <laughs> to keep this species going. But meanwhile, all of the forces, you know, that did in the alalas uh, are raging, continue to this day. Hawaii has been called the extinction capital of the world. Um, it's, it has uh, tremendous problems with invasive species, uh, habitat loss, the forest has you know, practically disappeared in many parts of Hawaii, um, and climate change now is sort of layered on top of this because one of the invasive species that's been brought in is, is mosquitoes, which carry avian malaria. And, and so there used to be sort of these refuges for, the, for some of the native Hawaiian birds on the tops of Hawaii's very, uh, uh, you know, all, uh, all of the islands have some pretty high peaks, and you used to be able to find some native birds up there, but now avian malaria is sort of creeping up the mountains, so these refuges are becoming smaller and smaller. So all of that rages, and, and meanwhile, you know, we're going to these amazing um, efforts to try to save them. So it seemed to me to be a really sort of perfect emblem of the situation. 
So to, to go back sort of to the beginning of the book, or, or even even earlier than the beginning, um, you know, the way, the way this book sort of came about, um, as, as Brad alluded to, is, and probably a lot of books come about this way, is I was actually, you know, looking to write an entirely different book. Um, I, had, I wrote a book on climate change, it's almost 10 years ago now, and I, I thought, well, that's just a huge story, right? You know, there can't really be a bigger story. Um, and so I, I wanted to just write a sort of follow-up. I was going to write a second book on climate change. But I, I kept bumping up. And so I, you know, did what reporters do. I went out and I, I talked to a lot of people and I did some stories for The New Yorker. And I, I kept bumping up against this idea that, that climate change is actually only one uh, of a whole constellation of ways that we are changing the planet, we being humans, um, on a scale that is, you know, on a geological scale, on a scale that is permanent, for all intents and purposes, permanent uh, for the history of, the, you know, going forward for this planet. And, and how are we doing that? You know, we're doing that by doing things that we consider to be uh, entirely ordinary, right? We drive our cars every time we burn a gallon of gas, you know, we put 20 pounds uh, of CO2 into the atmosphere. And this just turns out to be, you know, no one intended it to be that way, but it turns out to have really dramatic effects. So one of the effects, uh, obviously, is climate change. You know, I, I know we're here in, in D.C., which is sort of a facts optional, you know, zone. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, where people think you can either, you know, believe in climate change or not, choose to believe, like you could choose, you know, a side of fries, maybe, or a side of coleslaw, um, but you can't, unfortunately, choose that. And you know, the facts are that the world uh, is warming very fast uh, and is <clears throat> warming very significantly. Uh, we're sort of pushing the climate backwards. Um, so I know it's been, you know, a cold winter here in the Northeast, but in in a global context, actually, this was the fourth uh, warmest January on on record just now. Um, and, and so when we take CO2 out of the ground, uh, we're really taking, you know, tiny little organisms that were buried uh, under the ground under very special circumstances over the course of hundreds of millions of years, uh, and we're just combusting them, their remains, and we're throwing that CO2 back into the atmosphere. Um, so it's, it's really running the geological clock backwards and at high speeds, like running a tape back uh, and at very, very high speeds. Uh, and we tend to think of, of climate change as a something that's going to affect, you know, Arctic species the most dramatically. Uh, they're losing, we're losing the Arctic ice cap. We are literally losing the Arctic ice cap. Um, if you're a polar bear, that's not good. Obviously, you hunt off the, off the sea ice. But actually, uh, one of the chapters, in one of the chapters, I go to uh, the Andes in Peru. Um, and really, it seems like climate change is really uh, going to be even greater threat to species in the tropics. And there are a lot of reasons for this, but one of the most obvious reasons is just that the tropics are where most species live, right? So I went out with this guy, um, Miles Silman. He's a, a, a wonderful guy, a biologist at Wake Forest. And he had laid out these tree plots. And each of these plots were two and a half acres. And they went down a ridge so that each one had a different elevation. And so each one would have a different average annual temperature. And there were about 20 of them. So 20 you know, times two and a half acres, 50 acres. And they had counted, they had tagged and ID'd every species of tree in these plots. And they had counted a thousand different species of tree, more than a thousand different species. So compare that with Canada's boreal forest, which covers a billion acres, okay, which has roughly 20 species of tree uh, in all of that. Uh, area, so you can see, you know, what you're talking about this this incredible richness, species richness in the tropics, which just is not matched uh, in the temperate zones or in the Arctic zones. And one of the characteristics of tropical species is they tend to have very narrow ranges. They're just they're they're well adapted to these very tiny climate bands. So. <clears throat> one of the things that Miles said to me was, as we were walking down this ridge, was look, pick out a leaf. You're going to see like a leaf in the path. If it has an interesting shape, try to follow that down the path. And you're only going to see it for, say, 100 meters or so, because that is the whole range of this tree. That's the only place you're going to find this tree. And so what they were looking at is, as the Andes warm, and they're warming very fast, you know, what is going to happen to these trees? So obviously trees can't you know, get up and move, 
but where you find these species is changing, and they have measured that. Even in the course of a decade, you can see these trees are on the move. But the interesting thing, or an interesting thing, is that some are moving very, very fast, basically tracking the climate, which is moving up the mountains at a rate of several meters per year. Uh, but a lot are sitting there. A lot are just sitting there. And so one of the chapters is on a species of tree uh, that's just sitting there. And the question is, as these communities break down, right, what is going to happen to all of the organisms you know, that also lived in those very narrow bands? And that is a much more difficult question to ask, to answer, because you know, obviously trees have the real advantage of sitting there, <laughs> uh, and they'll be there year after year, and you can come back and track them. And that insect is really hard to tag and track. Um, but one of the points, so what is going to happen you know, to all of the organisms that depend on these trees? Uh, and unfortunately, as, as Miles Silman put it to me, you know, we're going to find out. We're in the process of finding out. We're in the process uh, of running this experiment, uh, which we don't really know where it's going to go. So an another way that we're, that we're changing the world uh, with our CO2 emissions, it's sometimes called climate change is equally evil twin. I'm sure you've all heard of it, uh, is the process uh, known as ocean acidification. So a lot of our CO2 emissions, we're putting up about 10 billion metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year, uh, and about a third of that is very, very rapidly being absorbed by the oceans. And when you dissolve CO2 in water, uh, you get uh, an acid, carbonic acid. We drink it. If you had a Coke today, you were drinking carbonic acid, but it's still an acid. Uh, and so we are changing the chemistry of the oceans, and that turns out to be something that's very hard to do. There's a lot of forces in the oceans that have tended to stabilize ocean chemistry, uh, and it's something that's associated with some of the worst uh, crises in the history of life, is changing ocean chemistry. So two, actually, two of the chapters in the book deal with ocean acidification. In one, um, I went swimming in the Mediterranean in the middle of winter, which is uh, an experience I really cannot recommend. Um, and another, I went to the Great Barrier Reef, which was uh, really, really an amazing experience. And coral reefs are uh, really um, of uh, the utmost concern right now. Uh, they're being devastated by a lot of different factors, climate change, uh, siltation, you know, uh, overfishing. All of those things are affecting uh, coral reefs. But ocean acidification uh, is sort of this, this ultimate threshold, you know, and the guys that I was out on the barrier reef with, um, and in one of the chapters, one of the species is, you know, a species of, of, of coral that's quite common on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they had these, they try to project out what happens as we continue, you know, to basically effectively pour acid into the water. And there are a lot of predictions that by the, the middle of this century, uh, coral reefs will have a lot of trouble keeping up with the forces that are breaking them down and just essentially uh, start to break down. So they are predicted to be, uh, I think I quote um, some, some British marine scientists, they are predicted to be the first uh, ecosystem of the modern era to, to simply vanish. Um, so how else are we changing the world? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just list one more. I could kind of go on here, but I, I, I'll I want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, we're moving things around the world. Okay, this is something that also strikes us as really ordinary. Uh, probably uh, when you go home, you know, if you have a backyard, you probably have species in that backyard that are non-native plants. Um, and some people have non-native pe pets, for example. Uh, so we do it a lot of the times purposefully, but we also do it more, even more often uh, these days, especially accidentally. So it's, it's estimated that there are 10,000 species moving around the world every day just in the ballast water of our, of our super tankers. And if you think about it, once again, this seems to us really ordinary, but if you try to take the long view here, it's really, really hard you know, for a plant to cross the oceans. And it's also really, really hard for a marine species to cross from one ocean basin to another. But we now do that routinely all the time. And when you're moving, so, so we're sort of reassembling the continents. If you, had come, if you had happened to be around about 250 million years ago, you would have found all of the continents assembled into one supercontinent, which is called Pangaea. 
Uh, and so then the continents broke apart, you know, plate tectonics, they drifted apart, and we got the world as we know it today with seven continents. But we are effectively, if you think about it, bringing those continents back together, bringing all of the life forms that evolved separately for tens of millions of years, bringing them back together. So you will hear biologists talk about uh, the new Pangaea. We're creating the new Pangaea. And when you bring together things that have evolved separately for a very, very long time, you know, there are a bunch of different things that can happen. And, and one, the most obvious, is, is nothing, right? So you bring something, you bring an Australian species to South America, it can't survive, uh, that's over, story over. Uh, or it can survive, but just sort of, you know, uh, muddle along and not really do a lot of damage, not really um, just coexist with the, spe the native species. Um, or the third thing is it can really, you know, cause something quite disastrous to happen. Uh, many islands, for example, have been really devastated. They had no mammalian predators until people brought foxes or rats or mongoose or cats. Uh, so island fauna has, ten has tended to be really devastated by these uh, invasive species that people have brought around. Uh, you can also get uh, introduced pathogens. Uh, and this is becoming an increasing uh, uh, cause of concern. And if you, if, even if a very, only a very, very tiny fraction of the species you're moving around the world turn out to be disastrous, you know, if you're moving 10,000 species a day, uh, it adds up pretty quickly. So one of the chapters in, in, in the book <coughs> deals with, and I'm sure everyone here has also heard of this, of uh, this phenomenon known as white nose syndrome, which is a disease that affects bats, and it affects s several different species of bats. And it's a fungus. Um, it's been genetically, we can now have very good genetic data on it. Uh, it's been tracked back to Europe. It was almost certainly uh, brought to this country by someone completely, not just inadvertently, totally unconsciously. That person does not know, you know, that they brought over this deadly f pathogen uh, to this country. But it was first uh, found, it, bats first sta started dying off uh, in upstate New York, not very far uh, from where I live. And it, it's killed millions and millions of bats right now. In fact, uh, in New England, um, estimates are that 80 percent, bat populations have plunged by 80 percent uh, in the last few years. Uh, and it continues to spread. It's, it's in this area. Uh, it's gone all, all the way to Oklahoma. Uh, it's in five, 23 states. Uh, and five Canadian provinces. Um, <coughs> and it's, it's uh, one of those, you know, just very, very weird uh, and difficult to anticipate uh, crises where something happens, someone brings over, you know, a species, a fungus, uh, that just shouldn't be here uh, and causes terrible, uh, terrible ramifications. So I'm just going to end, end uh, in the middle of the book, I'm going to read a little description um, of a trip I took to a bat cave uh, a couple years ago. And all you have to know to, to understand this phenomenon, I, I should also say that this, this affliction uh, afflicts hibernating bats. So bats in the Northeast <coughs> hibernate in the winter. If they stay here, they either, they either migrate out in the winter or they hibernate. And they do that by uh, going underground often uh, into a cave or a, a mine shaft. Uh, they hang by their toes. Uh, they, they go into sort of almost a state of suspended animation. Their body temperature drops to the ambient temperature. Uh, their immune system shuts down. And they have to live off these tiny little fat reserves that they have. They have to get through uh, to the spring on those. And anything that disturbs them uh, is, can be deadly because they just don't have the energy reserves to wake up and go flying around. And that seems to be what White Nose is doing. Them doing It's irritating them. They wake up. Uh, they go either looking for food or for water. We're not entirely sure. Uh, and they just drop dead. So that's what, what you have to know. And the other thing that you have to know, just to know some of the characters here, uh, is that a guy named Al Hicks was one of the very first people to stumble upon these, this bat die-off in upstate New York. He works for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, and a few weeks before the trip I was describing here, uh, we had gone to see a, a mine shaft in the Adirondacks where there were lots and lots of dead bats. So Aeolus Cave, which is set into a wooded hillside in Dorset, Vermont, is believed to be the largest bat hibernaculum in New England. It's estimated that before White Nose hit, 
Nearly 300,000 bats, some from as far away as Ontario and Rhode Island, came there to spend the winter. A few weeks after I went with Hicks to Barton Hill Mine, he invited me to accompany him to Aeolus. This trip had been organized by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and at the bottom of the hill, instead of strapping on snowshoes, we all piled onto snowmobiles. The trail zigged up the mountain in a series of long switchbacks. The temperature, about 25 degrees, was far too low for bats to be active. But when we parked near the entrance to the cave, I could see bats fluttering around. The most senior of the Vermont officials, Scott Darling, announced that before going any farther, we'd all have to put on latex gloves and Tyvek suits. This seemed to me to be paranoid. <clears throat> However, soon I came to see the sense of it. Aeolus was created by water flow over the course of thousands and thousands of years. To keep people out, the Nature Conservancy, which owns the cave, has blocked off the entrance with huge iron slats. With a key, one of the horizontal slats can be removed. This creates a narrow gap that can be crawled or slithered through. Despite the cold, a sickening smell emanated from the opening, half game farm, half garbage dump. The stone path leading to the gate was icy and difficult to get a footing on. When it was my turn, I squeezed between the slats and immediately slid into something soft and dank. This, I realized, picking myself back up, was a pile of dead bats. The entrance chamber of the cave, known as Guano Hall, is maybe 30 feet wide and 20 feet high at the front. Toward the back, it narrows and slopes. The tunnels that branch off from these are accessible only to spelunkers, and the tunnels that branch off from those are accessible only to bats. Peering into Guano Hall, I had the sense I was staring into a giant gullet. The scene in the dimness was horrific. There were long icicles hanging from the ceiling, and from the floor, large knobs of ice rose up like polyps. The ground was covered with dead bats. Some of the ice knobs, I noticed, had bats frozen into them. There were torpid bats roosting on the ceiling and also wide awake ones, which would take off and fly by, or sometimes right into us. Hicks and Darling had planned to do a count of the bats in Guano Hall, but this plan was quickly abandoned in favor of just collecting specimens. Darling, Darling explained to me that the specimens would be going to the Amer American Museum of Natural History in New York so that there would at least be a record of the hundreds of thousands of bats that had once wintered in Aeolus. This may be one of the last opportunities, he said. In contrast to a mine, which has been around for at most a few centuries, Aeolus, he pointed out, has existed for millennia. It's likely that bats have been hibernating there generation after generation since the cave's entrance was exposed at the end of the last ice age. That's what makes this so dramatic. It's breaking the evolutionary chain, chain Darling said. He and Hicks began picking dead bats off the ground. Those that were too badly decomposed were tossed back those that were more or less intact were sexed and placed in a two-quart plastic bag. I helped out by holding the bag for dead females. Soon it was full and another one was started. When the specimen count hit somewhere around 500, Darling decided it was time to go. Hicks hung back. He'd brought along an enormous camera and said he wanted to take more pictures. In the hours we'd been slipping around in the cave, the carnage had grown even more grotesque. Many of the bat carcasses had been crushed, and now there was blood oozing out of them. As I made my way up toward the entrance, Hicks called out after me, don't step on any dead bats. It took me a moment to realize he was joking. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now um, open up for questions. Um, if people want to ask a question, please just come to the mic. Thanks. Um, what would you say of, say, having a triage system of animals, of those that are fine without us, those that are unsaved, that we consider them doomed, and those that we could save through conservation? I know it's uh, not the best approach, but seeing limited resources and the fact that there's really a lack of political will for doing any sort of environmental work seems like the best yeah. solution. Well, I mean, in, in a sense, that is the system that we have, right? I mean, you know, we've chosen to, to, to spend a lot of resources, um, you know, on certain species. They tend to be, you know, big, big and charismatic or maybe in some cases big and cuddly, but although I guess most animal, big animals aren't really that cuddly. Um, but, you know, I think that 
So, so we are. We are triaging in a sense. We're, we're letting a lot of things go. And a lot of things that we're letting go, we don't even know about. So th one of the real complexity is, you know, to saying, okay, well, we're going to rationalize this system, you know, we're going to, we know we're going to lose a lot of species, let's, let's make this choice, you know, which ones we want to hold on to is, we don't know what's out there. Uh, and so I, I, as I say, I, I can't, I'm not arguing against, you know, that we're, we're doing it uh, effectively, we're doing a lot of things without intending to. Um, but I don't think that we can take a lot of solace from that. I don't think that it's a, it's a process that really can be, um, you know, rationalized in a way that is going to um, protect us <laughs> or, 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 or the, the biosphere in general. How's that? Um, just wanted to thank you first and, and just uh, sort of pause on the, I think, what is the profound fact that we're doing this without intending to. Uh, I'm sure we could be much more... Uh, devastating if we in <laughs> intended to do it but um i sort of i come at I'm this i'm not sure about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> um sort of I, I come at this from kind of the the entire kind of ecological perspective and i look at it and say when we've when we've encountered problems in the past as a species um we've used innovation to sort of get out of say resource constraints uh any other sort of problem uh, some people are now proposing de-extinction as a technological as a technological solution right. um but, you know, there are some, I think, uh, problems that we haven't yet sort of solved as a species. You know, you can look at um, we haven't decoupled GDP growth and population growth from carbon intensity, for example. Uh, the GDP grows, the uh, population grows, and carbon emissions continue to grow. Uh, we also know, and we have interesting work that shows that uh, we, as humans, we don't really adequate, have the faculties to adequately uh, assess uh, exponential growth in, say, extinction rates, all the hockey stick things you talk about, we can't adequately assess how, you know, four right. exponents removed, yeah. how that's going to affect right. Right. our future. Uh, and so I guess, how do you, my question being kind of dumbfounded about this <laughs> whole process is, how do you actually appeal to someone who's skeptical of the, the depth of the problem and what we might go about doing to solve it? Uh, do you do you marshal moral arguments? Do you marshal kind of the precautionary principle? Um, do you marshal kind of self-interest? And, and how do you uh, re rebut um, the kind of moral hazard problems uh, that are brought about by de-extinction as a technology? How do you, um, how do you re rebut the idea that, you know, in, in a sense, we're just uh, Darwinian you know Darwin's example of a successful species, um, and yeah, how do you wow, appeal? There's, there's a lot there. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> I mean, just to take up de-extinction for for one moment, um, uh, as 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 the gentleman said, you know, there's this there's this idea. It's it's it's, it's really being pushed a lot by by Stuart Brand. Those of you who read the Whole Earth Catalog, this is this is Stuart's latest project, uh, and I th I guess he's put a fair amount of resources behind it. Um, is is this idea of, of de-extinction, and it's theoretically possible when you when you think about it. You know, there are, there are a lot of species that we, especially things that have have gone extinct recently. We we there's actually an example of of, of, of animals that have um, where we've saved their genetic material, and and people have tried to clone them. They they haven't succeeded. Um, but if you have this frozen genetic material, which increasingly we have, right, like those bats were going to be cryogenically preserved at the Museum of Natural History, uh, then you could potentially, you know, transfer that, uh, that genetic material and, and, and recreate uh, those animals. But, but the question, it seems to me, you have to ask yourself is, well, you know, why did that animal go extinct in the first place? Where, where are you going to put it if you, if you de-extinct it, as it were? Uh, and it seems, and 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 as that gen as the gentleman said, there's a real, also a real moral hazard here. Oh, well, you know, we'll we'll just put those that guy in the freezer, you know, and and when when we're done with this project, whatever the hell that this project is, you know, we'll 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 take him out of the freezer and we'll we'll bring him back. And that seems to me, um, you know, it's an interesting idea. It's a very provocative idea, and people are really interested in it. But it it definitely you can you can see it having a certain a certain dangerous allure. How's that? Um, and the other, all of those other questions, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer. I mean, the question of how do we, do, how do we marshal people's attention and care um, is a really interesting one. And I guess the only thing I will say is that I, I recently read, actually, that the, that the Pope is preparing an environmental encyclical 
Um, he named himself Francis, which was a you know provocative mm. and uh, really interesting move. Um, and he was recently he recently said, and he claimed that he was quoting someone else, I think, but he said, and this was, I thought, also really interesting from the Pope, he said, um, God always forgives, uh, people occasionally forgive, uh, but nature never forgives. Um, and I think that, I, I personally will be very interested to see what he has to say, because I, I do think, um, I'm not sure that anyone could speak to this this issue more compellingly than the Pope. Um, so I guess I guess we'll have to wait and see what he says. Uh, my turn. Um, oh, sorry, hey. sorry. I went the wrong way. I'm oh. going to go this way, and then I'll go that way. Oh, sorry. okay. Um, excellent book. Thank you for, for writing it. Um, I'm also a science writer, and I w as I was reading it, I, I couldn't help but wonder, was it hard not to get overwhelmed by the topic and sort of the... Well, you know, uh, what, what I, I, I've gotten asked that a lot, and, and it's a very, very legitimate question, but one of, the, one of the sort of paradoxical things about writing the book, you know, and I alluded to a couple of the places that I got to go, was that, you know, in, in, in sort of tracing human impacts on the planet, I, I actually got to go to some of the ma most amazing places that are left in the world, you know, the Andes, the high Andes, and the Great Barrier Reef, and the Amazon, and... Everywhere that, you know, I went, I was going with he with teams that were looking at human impacts. That's why we're there. You know, that's exactly why we had, you know, schlepped to the ends of the earth. Um, but, but the experience of being there was actually, you know, kind of exhilarating. It was kind of amazing. And I feel very, very lucky that I got to go to those places. So it was a very mixed, you know, on a personal level, just, you know, the mechanics of putting the book together had had both elements to it. Um, hi. Um, so I if there's um, people that uh, want to do something to to stop global warming, there's a group that I like a lot, so Citizens Climate Lobby. So I'd like to encourage people to look into Citizens Climate Lobby. Okay. That's out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Did everyone hear that? Citizens Climate Lobby. They're getting a plug. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to mention that in the 80s, the first symposium on the loss of biodiversity really really came on very strong, and three or four publications arose from that. Conservation of biodiversity became a precedent after that. Uh, those things all happened before climate change, and those causes are still ongoing. Urbanization, uh, overfishing, loss of agrobiodiversity, uh, contamination of certain uh, freshwater areas and so on and so forth, um, and deforestation and so on. So I'm wondering, do you see climate change as overarching all of those or on the equivalent footage or how do you reconcile what you're coming with in light of what's been recognized for the last 20, 30 years? Well, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I certainly don't want to claim <coughs> that, that any of this is is new except that we keep you know, sort of discovering, as it were, that we're doing new things um, and that they're, uh, that they are potentially very, very serious. So, for example, you know, when the term biodiversity crisis was, f was coined, which is, you know, probably a good 30 years ago or whatever, um, maybe even longer, uh, uh, you know, people weren't talking about climate change. They weren't talking about ocean acidification. So all of these are just sort of new problems that that we lay on top of the the old problems, and some people would would say, I think there's an interesting feeling, sort of in the conservation community, that climate change has sort of taken all the oxygen, as it were, to use a sort of bad pun, yeah, and um, <laughs> and it's really divert, you know, a lot of attention. People pay more attention to climate change because climate change has, you know, pretty direct impacts on human society that we're already seeing and only going to see more of, and whereas, you know, extinction is a pretty diffuse. Uh, problem and it's something that people in you know Washington D.C. are not necessarily immediately in contact with because everything was already eliminated from Washington D.C. a long time ago, um, <laughs> and I, I think there's something to that you know and I you know and I sort of plead guilty you know I, I wrote a book about climate change that I you know very much wanted to get people's attention with, um, and I don't have. Uh, you know, are those th those two issues should not be in competition? How's that? Um, 
And there are many, many studies out there also predicting that, you know, no matter what is driving biodiversity loss in a particular area right now, climate change has the potential to dwarf uh, all of those um, because everything is on the move, right? All, you know, vast numbers of species are moving toward the poles, uh, they're moving up slope, uh, and they're going to run into these, you know, barriers uh, along the way, and they're not going to be able to uh, get through them. Um, so, you know, I, that's a long-winded way of saying I, I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, it's not, it's not a new problem. It's not a problem that's going anywhere. I mean, one of the points I make in the book is this has been going on, you know, the Polynesians arrived in Hawaii 1,500 years ago. This is not a new problem, you know. Uh, the, the newness of it only is, uh, you know, are we, are we going to, now that we have been, many, many people are sound, have, have and are sounding the alarm, are we going to bring it into sort of consciousness? Thank you. Hi. Um, I don't know whether this is going to help, but did anybody consider that the 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 Hawaiian blackbird might be gay. <laughs> <laughs> I, that you know, I, that's okay. a really. I, I we should bring that back to her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's not my question okay. though. <laughs> okay. Um, he liked her. He liked her, <laughs> but I, but that might not be. So. Whatever we do, the forces are against us as far as extinction goes. It, most of the species that ever were are gone. It's, it's highly likely that our specialized being is, is very vulnerable to extreme changes. Okay. So that, I believe that's a given for me. We're going. Okay. But while we're here, why isn't there some sort of a strategy? In other words, we've got all this technology and all these computers and so forth. Why don't we start building something that we can at least aim for, and it might need to be tweaked? Because, I mean, the way we're going now, and this building is not... Building something. What's the thing? Okay, the thing is... What do we do about our economies? What do we do about our, our, our attitude towards material things? Uh, how, how do we build a sustainable system? What sort of a population can this planet deal with in terms of both what resources are available, but how adaptable we are? What size of a population? We have to go cross borders, cross governments. How do we want to govern ourselves? In other words, yeah. What I'm saying is, and I'll wind this up, but what I'm saying is we could be the first species that goes out whining. <laughs> <laughs> when they come back, the archaeologist of the next planet. They, they might bitch, not bitch, have bitch. a record of our whining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how we'll leave that behind. But, um, I mean. Do you know of anything yeah. that exists that's well, doing a, a that? Lot, a lot of people are, you know, looking at, 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 at these questions from various, you know, d different angles. I mean, many, many very smart people. The, the problem is, and, and, you know, you could use climate change as a, as a, as a case in point, right? We, we have a reasonable idea of, of what we could do to, to, to mitigate climate change, not, not to solve climate change. We are never solving climate change uh, because it's already, you know, a, there's a lot of warming in the pipeline. Uh, but we could we could minimize it from here forward. We we have a s an idea of what we need to do. We need to stop emitting uh, CO two. Uh, and has that happened? You know, absolutely not. Right? That we're we're doing going the opposite direction. Emissions are going you know up like this. So the the difference between the pe th you know th many very smart thoughtful people you know sitting at their computers or wherever they're sitting or having meetings or. Uh, you know, and and actually, what's happening on the ground is is very very great. So I do think that there are very very smart people trying to think of, you know, in in all of the areas I, I spoke of. You know, here are ways that we're changing the planet. What could we, uh, in that are very serious, are going to have very serious impacts. What could we try to do to minimize those impacts? But meanwhile, you know, all of the other forces are arrayed to maximize our impact. So. You know, there's just a, a terrible disconnect there. Um, it doesn't mean that people aren't thinking. Uh, it means that we're not acting, and and, and that's sort of, you know, one of the 
one of the impetuses for writing a book like this is okay, you know, to try to bridge that gap a little bit. Probably, probably the only way to stop extinction is um, figure out a way so people, someone or people will make a profit off it. <laughs> but that's not what I was going to bring up. I'm a, a caver, and I've been following white nose syndrome with sort of morbid fascination. It's as you probably know, it started in Howe Caverns near Albany, and uh, there's some evidence which you may have heard of that. Uh, Bat populations in Europe were affected the same way, but probably thousands of years ago. And the population that exists there now is just a remnant. And they apparently aren't affected by white nose syndrome too much. And and the other thought is, in the really long view, uh, maybe some of you will remember a book called uh, After Man by Dougal Dixon, who's an English biologist and artist, really great combination. And uh, he postulated both what the continent, continents would look like, uh, say, 5, 10, 15, 50 million years from now, but also extrapolated um, what would fill the niches after humans were gone. And one of the the ones that really stuck in my mind was uh, carnivorous rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I go out with a, a geologist, a British geologist, uh, who who has a, a not dissimilar theory uh, that rats, you know, rats are very adaptable. They're now in a lot of places where they never were before. Uh, humans have brought rats virtually everywhere, and that giant rats, you know, and he 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 imagines these giant rats wearing. Um, the skins of other mammals uh, and living in caves. So, you know, the whole process could start all over again. Kai, um, am I close enough to this? I, I don't know. People back there, can you hear? Do you think it's possible to reduce emissions and slow down climate change to the extent that we need to without addressing population growth? You know, that, that's, that's a very good question, and the, the problem that, the situation that we're in now, though, is the time frames are such, you know, if, if you really want to reduce emissions, you know, once again, what are we talking about? You know, there's this idea out there, uh, for example, that's sort of enshrined in international, you know, not law, but compacts, that uh, we're going to try to keep uh, climate change to an average uh, global increase of under two degrees Celsius, so you know three point six Fahrenheit or whatever. And we're really we're blowing by that very fast. We haven't blown by it yet, but you know we don't show any signs of of stopping uh, on this you know upward curve. Um, so the steps that we need to take, you know, people will say, well, we basically need to. I mean, I had people tell me, you know, Jim Hansen tell me. And it's in the book I, I wrote on climate change you know, about 10 years ago. We have 10 years to turn around uh, this trajectory. It's now 10 years later. You know, do we still have 10 years? I, I don't know. But we have a very short time frame uh, to avoid going beyond 2 degrees Celsius. And it has to be very radical. It has to you know, hit here and then come down very, very sharply. So we need to do this in a time frame in which there are 7 billion people on the planet. There's just no way around that, you know. So whereas in a, in a, in a longer time frame, obviously, you know, population control and, and bringing down the curve of human population is, you would, you would say, pretty essential to this project of minimizing human impacts. The, the task on another time frame of, of minimize, you know, trying to avoid blowing through uh, some of these 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 boundaries uh, has to take place. I don't think anyone's advocating, you know, population control of like existing people. Um, so we have to we have to reconcile those two facts. You know that we've got 7.2 billion people. The demographics of the world are such that we are going to reach 8 billion. We're going to reach 8 billion in about a decade from now. Uh, we're moving really really fast, um, and we've got to try to do it with the you know seven eight nine billion people. Uh, that we have, which isn't to say that we shouldn't be trying to do everything we can uh, to reduce, you know, birth rates, but but we've got to do everything sort of simultaneously. 
Two quick questions. As a writer, I'm really curious about your process for getting this book done, how long it took you, how much work you did before you went into the field and that kind of thing. Um, as a scientist, I'm curious about the, the um, juxtaposition of biodiversity, protecting biodiversity, which is really what extinction is all about, and putting animals in zoos and aquaria and so on to keep examples of the species. And I'm wondering if you have an, op an op opinion about using zoos and other thing, uh, you know, other institutions like that to protect animals that we're going to lose in the wild. Um, well, the first question, um, what was the first? <laughs> Process. Oh, the process was very painful. How's that? Yeah, uh, it was very. Um, yeah, it took me. I mean, I I basically started this book. Um, I went to that. You know, I went. To, I started by which is the first chapter of the book. I went to Panama. That was uh, five years ago. So basically, the the book took five years of, of, and I do a lot of work before I go out in the field with people. I try to have a pretty good idea of what I'm getting into as I write about in some of the chapters here I was wrong uh, <laughs> in some cases and that in some cases had fortuitous you know consequences that turned out to be good uh, and in some cases it had fortuitous consequences that turned out to be bad um, but I do I do try to know pretty much what I'm getting into um, I'm pretty keen on that because you're going halfway around the world in some cases um, and the zoo question I think is a really interesting one I, I wrote a piece on zoos um, a, about a year ago or so for National Geographic, actually. And I came away much more impressed with zoos. And that's in, that includes the National Zoo here. The big zoos have tremendously big conservation programs right now. Um, and they are sort of as in tune as anyone with the fact that, you know, the wild is disappearing. There are no more. There is no more wild. Um, and well, I think that everyone would agree, you know, that uh, keeping animals in a zoo uh, just to preserve the species is a is a very very you know sad outcome and not to be desired. Um, you know, effectively, a lot of parts in the wild are becoming zoos. That's what a lot of the zoo people told me, and it's really true, right? You will have reserves that are really so small and have to be so carefully managed uh, that they might as well. You know, they're effectively zoos these days. So, you know, do we want to be keeping more and more species alive like that? Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, they're called conservation-dependent species, and their and their numbers are rising really, really fast. I mean, all of the you know species that are you know uh, uh, down to a couple hundred individuals, of which there are many, uh, are effectively being kept alive by people at this point. Um, and they are very labor-intensive. And if people suddenly stop doing it, right, like the California condor, uh, if people stopped taking those condors in and treating them for lead poisoning. Uh, we would have no more condors. So many, many millions of dollars later, uh, and, and and tens of years later, we are keeping those condors alive. Is that how we want to be spending our resources? Wouldn't it be better, you know, not to not to have the problem? But but we're in that situation. Uh, I want to thank you for your efforts in this what appears to be a Sisyphean task of bringing these issues to the power notice of the powers that that be. Uh, would you comment on the um, proposals that are beginning to float around now about putting uh, additional compounds into our stratosphere uh, in order to mitigate global warming and the geopolitical implications of that? Well, this, this is another idea sort of like de-extinction. You know, it has a lot of sort of sci-fi kind of appeal. This is the idea of geoengineering, right? We're going to, we are, we're, we are engineering. We are re-engineering the climate right now. You know, that's what we're doing. And so now we're going to reverse, reverse engineer it. We're going to, um, you know, re engineer it in one way, and then we're going to engineer it back the other way, and they're all going to sort of meet in the middle. And so, you know, one idea is that we will um, put sulfate particles into the stratosphere like a volcano does uh, and that uh, bounces sunlight back towards space and uh, so that could you know sort of counteract the effects of CO2 but one thing that's important to recognize besides you know whoa that's this sort of scary thing to be doing um, is it doesn't do anything for the oceans right it doesn't do anything for what we're doing to the oceans and if you uh, care about the oceans which I'm not 
you know, saying you should just care about because, you know, they're fantastic, and but they're really, really important and cover 70% of this planet, uh, then you're not doing anything for them. And no one has come up with a scheme, you know, that both uh, deals with even a scheme, you know, even theoretically a scheme that both deals with, with climate change and ocean acidification. And I, I have not heard of one, and I think most scientists would tell you it simply doesn't exist. So, you know, to continue on the path we're on and then hope that once again some geoengineering solution is going to help us is to, you know, really, really put a lot, a lot of faith uh, in humans' abilities to collectively solve problems, which ironically is precisely what the problem is. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's sort of an interesting logical conundrum. A couple of points. One is that the uh, we're going to get we're going to run a big experiment this this spring on Yay. just. Sorry. Um, one problem we have this spring is is just how warm the Arctic is this this winter. It's just historically warm. It's it's in. There's a there's this interesting chart that the Danish Meteorological Institute puts out, which shows these temperatures north of 80 degrees, and it's unlike anything I've ever seen. Yeah, no, we, they, we hit a new record, I think, for for winter ice last last month. Yeah, new low. Uh, yeah, new low, and it's yeah. it's it's very scary because last year we had a we had a <coughs> brief cold spell right at the end, and that really led to much less melting than we had before. So if the system is as sensitive the other way as it proved to be cold last year. Yeah, we're in big trouble. Yeah, we won't, we won't, we won't sort of know. The melt season is, you know, uh, the summer. So we'll see, we'll see what the, what things are like well, at the end be, of the we summer could melt be ice season. Free. Yeah, it it could definitely be another mm. record low. And the other point I wanted to make is about population, which is people are going to live a lot longer. I think everyone needs you to speak up a little bit. People are going to live longer than we are. Than we're now planning for, by four or five years. In my case, I'm now 72. Um, and this, this is a problem that I think we just don't understand yet, just exactly how severe this is going to, how big the financial implications are for managing this, this whole issue of resources. Okay, thank you. Okay, two more. We got last two. Okay. Uh, I'm happy that you went down to the Andes. Uh, being half Ecuadorian, um, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, uh, we Americans, uh, maybe I, I I know it's like thousands of Americans, maybe 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 a couple million, go down to Ecuador. They build three new airports in uh, Quito, Guayaquil, and Cuenca, and we bring our bad habits. So we, I, we give up, we give up, we give up on the United States, and we go down to Ecuador with our bad habits, building mansions and and oh, you know, save the forest, and you know, we're we're very poor examples. Of, if you can comment, because uh, we we give up, we give. I I say we just stay here, just just stay here, and live with it. You know, live live in your nice house and and live in our bubble. But you know, we we go down to South America and, and we're we're cutting down the forest, and then we're the first ones to to be global, you know, environmentalists. To yeah. Stop stop the change and and. Uh, well, we just bring our bad habits. Well, even even if we weren't bringing our bad habits, we we would be very very you know, it it wouldn't be easy. It's not easy for Amer you know Americans to, um, you know, we 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 cut down all our forests, uh, and it's not easy for us to go tell people, you know, do as I do as we say and not as not as we we do. So we're not very good uh, examples, and you know that's exactly part of the problem. If you we're hoping that the U.S. was going to take, you know, a leadership role, say, once again, to revert to climate change. Uh, that isn't happening. And without that happening, uh, it's hard to see why anyone else, it's hard to see why the Ecuadorians shouldn't, you know, wrap up their carbon emissions. Uh, you know, wh wh who are we to tell them not to, who are among the world's, you know, great carbon emitters? So, you know, I, yeah, uh, all I can say is yeah. <laughs> Um, I noticed in your um, book jacket that you and your family live in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and I was wondering if, um, with your contact with college students, whether you've formed an opinion as to the level of their environmental literacy and the, let's say, also the adequacy of environmental education in our schools. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think that, um, you know, th 
I think on a lot of campuses there are a lot of young people for whom this is sort of the core is a core issue for them but it's not it's not uh you know it's not racking campuses the way you might sort of hope because you know in the in the case of of, of climate change this is a real de definitely an intergenerational issue where you know my generation our generation is going to be leaving a problem to our kids and grandkids and and you could get pretty angry about that um and i don't see that level of of of, of anger and I you know I don't see I don't see kids wanting to make you know the kind of changes even on on campus that are uh, really n needed um, if we're gonna turn that curve around so I I do think there's a lot going on um, but I don't see enough I don't see enough energy and broad enough support how's that thanks a lot